Vic um, with the League of Women Voters. Um, and uh, I was honored uh, earlier this year to hear our speaker um, talk to the League of Women Voters of Indiana Council meeting. Um, and uh, Barbara is leading us uh, in the uh, leading the Indiana Vote by Mail organization. They are a nonprofit organization. And um, I'm just going to turn it right over to Barbara and let her jump right in and tell us all about this. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Sarah. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before the group tonight and um, to speak to people that use the uh, library system and anyone else that may have joined. So thank you for the opportunity to bring the message of Indiana Vote by Mail to a wider audience. As uh, Sarah and Lisa said, Indiana Vote by Mail is a not-for-profit, non-partisan organization dedicated to making sure that everyone has equal access to the polls. So we will not endorse candidates. Um, we will certainly talk to elected officials and we will talk to candidates, anyone that's running for office if they want to talk to us, but we will endorse no one in particular. We advocate for full vote by mail and vote at home, and we use those terms interchangeably, and I'll explain in, in a few slides why we use both those terms. We, we, they mean the same thing, basically, but there's, uh, there, there's some differences between absentee voting and then what we mean by vote at home or vote by mail. We obviously advocate for safe and secure voting because it's very important that voter confidence stays very high. And then fiscally responsible voting practices. We spend a lot of money in Indiana on electronic voting machines, which are not the safest way to vote. And we certainly want a paper trail for all elections so that elections can be audited if they need to. How do we do what we do? Well, we advocate for legislation and then public education and awareness through programs such as this. And I appreciate the, the opportunity to come before the, the folks in Hamilton County and speak. So let's jump right in. Um, as of today, this afternoon, I did look it up this afternoon on the um, indianavoters.in.gov website. Indiana has four, just over 4.6 million registered voters. So our average statewide voting rates, not so great. This data is easily available from the Secretary of State's website. So since 1990, in general elections, our average voting rate is 52%. Of course, that skews higher in presidential years and lower in midterm years. And for primary elections, we it's it's just, it's abysmal. I mean, 26% on average is nothing that we should be proud of. And we should all do all we can to make sure that voting is accessible for more Hoosiers and that everyone shows up to vote. So let's talk about the ways you can vote in Indiana. And there are three ways. Number one, you can show up on election day to vote, and some voters just prefer this. They want to go to a polling location. Um, they may need to go to a polling location to access assistive technology if they're disabled, or maybe they, they just prefer to vote that way. I mean, there's lots of reasons why people still need to go to polling locations. So I don't want anyone to think that this organization, Indiana Vote by Mail, is in any way advocating for doing away with polling locations. We are not advocating for doing that. Um, but on election day, what kinds of conditions are we going to be facing? Are there, is there going to be crowding in lines? Uh, what about air, air circulation in all the polling places? Um, and what about enforcements of social distancing and face masks? Those are the, some of the concerns about in-person voting on election day. Early in-person voting is another way to vote in Indiana. Um, each county will have its own number of sites, satellite sites. Of course, the county clerks have to open up their central locations for voting on October the 6th, but they can have any number of satellite sites starting later in the month of October, and the county election boards decide on that. But again, the same thing on satellite sites, because this is just gonna be a banner year by all predictions in terms of voter turnout, are we gonna be dealing with the same thing as we would on election day with air circulation and enforcement measures? We don't know. And then the third way to vote is by um, absentee, and you have to apply and s select a reason for why you're choosing to vote by absentee, and you have to fill out an application, et cetera, and that tends to disenfranchise voters. So the three ways to vote, um, so keep that in mind. Just so you know, the Secretary of State 
um, considers election day one type of voting and then absentee voting is actually early in person and absentee by mail. So the, the, the number two and number three are considered one category, absentee voting by the Secretary of State. They're, they don't distinguish that. So there are ba barriers to voting. The Carnegie Corporation came out with a study a couple of years ago where they said, okay, we've, we've determined that there are barriers to voting. And when various states across the nation have enacted various laws to uh, protect the safety of elections or whatever they thought they were doing at the time, none of these were enacted with the idea that the legislature was trying to disenfranchise voters. But what happens in practice is in combination, these things do disenfranchise voters. So things like voter ID requirements, voter roll purges, which we certainly have seen some of in Indiana, um, lack of funding, reduced early voting, reduced voting hours, all of these things in combination tend to disenfranchise voters. But there are solutions to these things. So a group called Nonprofit Vote and then a, the US Elections Project, which is run by a professor out of the University of Florida, came out with a study in 2018 after the elections and said, okay, what are the solutions to those barriers? Well, solutions that look like things like same day voter registration or automatic voter registration, vote by mail, pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds, redistricting reform and so on. So there are ways to combat the barriers, we just have to have the legislative stomach to do it in Indiana, and it's not clear that we necessarily do. The more difficult challenge for 2020 is um, the misinformation and disinformation that's propagated by bots and trolls. I should say it probably starts with bots and trolls, and then it gets picked up by various parties, um, I think within the country and people run with it and just take it to its extremes. And the, the idea behind these ideas are that it's, it gets us fired up where, wherever we are in the political spectrum, whether we're to the far left, the far right, wherever, it gets us all fired up and it gets us all upset. And that's the goal of all this misinformation and disinformation. And we have to work very hard to resist it from whatever our political perspective is. And we have to recognize that it is what it is. Even if we think, oh, well, this feeds into my view of the world. Well, it, there may be some misinformation in there or it may be trying to wind me up. Things like misinformation about the postal service or the myth of voter fraud. We have to be aware of these things. But these all kind of grind together as gears that the net effect of is that it creates an atmosphere of voter suppression. Voters lose confidence, they don't think their ballot's gonna be counted, and they throw up their hands in, in frustration and say, well, why am I gonna to bother to vote? It doesn't even matter. And we can't let that happen. So let's combat the myth for a second of voter fraud. The Brennan Center for Justice has done a number of studies um, that have looked at voter fraud, and they said most of the voter fraud that they've seen is actually due to clerical errors and bad data matching. Likewise, the Heritage Foundation has looked at vote by mail states and said, well, gee, there's no higher and certainly often lower per capita rates of voter fraud in vote by mail states as there is in traditional um, state, states that do traditional election. Um, there are a number of resources and appendix um, on the last slide, there were, I have a bunch of resources for combating misinformation in an appendix at the end of this presentation. And there are resources about voter fraud also in the appendix I will show you at the end. And that is useful resource information. So let's look at Colorado for a second. Colorado is a vote by mail state. This study was released in early May of this year and it looked at Colorado pre-vote by mail versus post-vote by mail. And it showed that across the board, across all demographics, all demographics saw an increase in voter participation. No matter pre-post, they saw everybody kind of participate at a greater level. In the demographics, race, age, income, wealth, et cetera, you saw an increase in participation in the areas that you would think. So in, in the race demographic, the most increase, increase for everybody, white voters, black voters, everybody, 
but it increased the most for black voters, Latinx voters, and Asian Americans. In the age groups, it saw the most increase in voters under 30, and so on and so forth amongst the other demographics. So it increases across the board, but it increases the most for the people that find it hardest to get to the, a polling location on election day. The one place that this study in particular did not find any benefit was a disproportionate effect in terms of benefiting Republicans or Democrats. There is no party effect on vote by mail. Republicans are gonna say, oh, it's gonna, Democrats are the only ones that are gonna use it. And Democrats say, oh, Republicans are the only ones that are gonna use it. It depends on where you are. In Florida, for instance, um, a highly uh, concentration, high concentration, excuse me, of um, retired folks, um, many of whom are Republicans, not all, but many of whom are Republicans, um, folks down there have uh, voted by mail for years and years because that's what the party has done down there in terms of you know promoting voter turnout. So it just depends on where you are um, and, and who gets to vote by mail. So no partisan advantage. In June of this year, the National Academy of Sciences released a report that said universal vote by mail, in fact, doesn't show a party advantage. And then 538, if you're familiar with um, that resource, there's is a good uh, link to a study that 538 has done that gives a lot of statistical evidence that also supports the fact that it doesn't um, give one party an advantage over another. So traditional voting versus vote by mail, this is what we're really talking about. In Indiana, we have, we're on the left side of the screen. We have an opt-in system where for each election, we have to apply for an absentee ballot. And uh, until this past June, only for June, not for the November general election, but for June, we got to not have to check a reason. But if every other, in every other election in Indiana, if we want to vote by mail, we have to remember to apply every single time there's an election and we have to check a reason. And then we have to send it in and then the county clerk's office, the election office has to deal with that piece of paper. So if we applied for the May election, we got to do it again for the November election and they have to process that same piece of paper. It's an opt-in system, as I said. In voted home states, it's an opt-out system. Ballots are automatically mailed to all registered voters every time there's an election. And the return options, of course, are by mail, but in fact, what most voters do, which is why we call it vote at home, is they return them in secure drop boxes or to staff voting centers or at a polling location on election day. They don't actually return them in the mail. Most of them put them in drop boxes, frankly. The states that do this are Oregon, which has done it for 20 years, Washington State, which has done it for about 10, maybe a little bit more than 10. Colorado has done it for about seven or eight. Utah, bright red state, much like um, Indiana or maybe even redder than Indiana has done it since last year, Hawaii this year for the first time for all voters, and others are transitioning. And frankly, the news is changing every single day and it's hard to keep up with, so it's a little hard to keep this, this uh, PowerPoint updated, but the states that have now transitioned to full vote by mail for the November election are California. Um, California had been moving county by county to vote by mail and it was pretty close to being full vote by mail anyway, but they, the governor said, okay, for the November election, because of the pandemic, we're gonna let everybody vote by mail. Nevada is sending ballots to all registered voters. New Hampshire is sending ballots to all registered voters. So there's a number of states that are jumping onto the bandwagon going, well, we were partially there anyway, we're just gonna go all the way there because of the conditions that we're dealing with. Again, this is an opt out system in the vote by mail states. You have to tell, your county registrar or election office or county clerk, I don't want a ballot mailed to me, I'm gonna show up and vote in person. Almost nobody does it because they like the convenience of being able to vote from their kitchen table. So let's look at Indiana's absentee excuses for a moment. So we have one of 12, 11, 12, 13, whatever reasons for um, choosing on an absentee ballot application why we can't show up in person. I would maintain why is it anybody's business why you can't show up at the polls on election day. But those reasons include, well, I think I'm gonna be gone from the county. I have to work during the entire 12 hours the polls are open. I'm confined due to illness or injury. I'm a registered sex, sex offender. I'm a, a member of the military or a public safety officer. Uh, 
uh, it's because of religious reasons. I have a disability. I'm over 65. I mean, think about over 65. If you're over 65 for the primary, aren't you still over 65 for the general election? Like, why make those people reapply? Anyway, the point of these is there's this little nudge and wink that we do in Indiana, which the governor even hinted at at one of his weekly press conferences when he said, well, the reasons on the absentee application are, are quite broad and can be interpreted broadly and are, are porous. And county clerks have even told me, look, we don't monitor these reasons. We're not gonna come to your house and, and say, you said you were gonna be gone on election day. How come you were at your house? How come you couldn't show up at the polls? No one's gonna do that. Number one, they don't have the staff to do it. Number two, they don't care to do it. So this kind of begs the reason, why do we even have the reasons there in the first place? They're, um, they're just superfluous. So why do we say vote by mail? Well, we want to keep voter trust in the electoral process high. We want to keep the security of our elections very high. We want people to continue to believe that their voice matters and to vote in every election. I highlighted reduced administrative burden and costs because it's important to understand that in vote by mail states, they've seen a reduction overall in their costs. So Colorado did a study and they reduced their pre and post vote by mail election costs by about 40%. Now what some people are gonna go is, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This says polling locations are cut, poll workers are cut. This happens organically over time. No, but no state comes in and does a wholesale swoop of vote by mail practices and suddenly they're not vote by mail and the next day they're vote by mail and everybody's adapted to it. They do it over time. So what they do is they start to mail everybody, every registered voter ballots and as over time, as more and more voters take advantage of the ballot that comes in their mailbox and they can sit at their kitchen table and complete, and they go, well, I'm not gonna show up at a polling center. And counties then look at their number of polling centers and say, well, I don't need X, I need X minus five or something. Over time, it just organically grows into a smaller number of polling centers. So it's not a one fell swoop, we're just gonna do this in one big cut. Studies have shown also that there is better down ballot engagement. You know, if you show up at a polling site on election day and you, you have to wait in line for several hours and you get up to, you know, you register, you get up to the check-in desk and they say, oh yeah, you're a voter. Okay, here's your ballot or whatever, how they guide you through the process. And then you go vote and you're like, I have, I waited for two hours and there's two hours of people behind me. I'd better get through this quickly maybe you just vote the top offices on the ticket and you don't go all the way down to dog catcher. What's been shown is that in studies, when voters are sitting at their kitchen table, instead of feeling rushed at a polling center, they tend to vote from president all the way down to dog catcher. They don't in all cases, but generally speaking, they tend to look at the whole ballot very carefully. Of course, improved participation by all populations and then overall higher voter turnout as we saw in the Colorado study. So this is what it actually looks like and how it works. I've already said every registered voter receives a ballot automatically two to three or even three to four weeks prior to an election. Depending on the state, they have different rules for how, often, how soon in advance of an election they mail the ballots. The thing that makes it vote by mail is the barcode on the inbound and outbound ballot envelope. So this barcode down at the bottom of this envelope, um, this red box around here. It's the same kind of technology that we see on Amazon packages or FedEx deliveries or UPS deliveries or whatever. But what that barcode does is it allows for ballot tracking by election staff. So the, so the election staff knows where the ballot is in the process, but it also gives the voter confidence because the voter signs up for text or email alerts. And then they say, oh, I can see the ballots on the way to me. I got a text message. Oh, I got a text message that says the ballot has been received back from the election office, to the election office, excuse me. Um, and so they know their ballot's gonna be counted. So that's the, that's the certainty around give, keeping voter confidence that they are able to track it. The other two things that are best practices or um, uh, standards are the envelope size. So there's a couple of envelope sizes that seem to make most sense for USPS. And then this, the election mail swoosh that's here on the envelope. So that's only allowed for ballot mail, inbound and outbound ballot mail. The other thing 
that is optional, not a requirement, but it is a best practice. And we actually saw this in practice when we uh, were in Denver and Orange County earlier this year, is this color bar down the side of the inbound and outbound envelopes. So the color bar, um, you know, on the outbound is like a blue stripe down the side of the envelope. And the inbound is a green stripe down the side, like pick your colors, doesn't matter what the colors are. The county election officials would decide on that if they decide that they wanna use it. But we saw it in practice in both counties, and I think most vote by mail states use this, and it allows another checkpoint for, for um, ballot mail to be easily identifiable. So if you're looking at a tray of envelopes that all have green bars down the side of them, because you know it's inbound back to the election office and there's an envelope with a blue in there, you're gonna go, wait a minute, something's wrong here. Um, so it's just another checkpoint. The other thing that is a best practice and actually the USPS and the Center for Civic Design and some other organizations recommend is very clear envelope design. So I happen to live in Marion County and um, the back of the ballot envelope in Marion County is complex. I mean, you just need to make sure you're filling it out very uh, clearly. Results in more um, voter errors, like maybe not signing the, signing the ballot envelope um, and in vote by mail states, they work very hard to keep, to make clear and concise envelope designs so that voters don't make those kind of mistakes. I'm not going to say they don't make those, voters don't make those kind of mistakes, but I think they make far less of them when there is very clear and thoughtful envelope design. So vote by mail actually gives options to voters. It doesn't require voters to vote when a ballot is received in the mail. I don't want you to go away from this presentation thinking that, you know, every vote by mail state has 100% voter participation because they don't, that nobody does, but they certainly have higher voter participation than Indiana. It doesn't do away with voting in person at a polling location if that's the way somebody wants to vote, as I said earlier. So we still want to preserve polling locations. In other words, it doesn't decrease options for voters to vote. So let's talk about polling locations for just a second. So in vote by mail states, of course you can vote in person. Even if you get your ballot in the mail, you can still vote in person if you choose to. So you can't do both. You can't send in your mail ballot and vote in person, that's illegal. But if you choose to vote in person for whatever reason, you can vote in person. Of course you can vote in person in Indiana. In vote by mail states, you can walk in and register right then and also vote right then. Can't do that in Indiana. You can update your existing voter registration. So if you're a current voter and you need to just update something about your registration, you can do that and vote at the same time. Can't do that in Indiana. And you can return your mailed ballot um, up to the close of polls on election day. In Indiana, we know that we have this arbitrary noon deadline for return of ballots. And then of course, assistive technology for disabled voters. We saw some assistive technology um, in, in California and in Denver when we were there earlier this year. I think Indiana could maybe do a bit better in that regard, as we've heard from some of the disability communities here in Indiana. So let's talk about voters with disabilities for just a second. There are a number of laws that deal with giving voters um, equal access to the polls, but what they really want and what the disability, some of the disability communities that we've talked to, we've just talked to a handful of them, have said to us is, we want the right to independent and private marking of ballots, just like able-bodied voters. Whether that means we do it at home with assistive technology that we have in our homes, or whether that means we go to polling sites with working assistive technology and poll staff who know how to use it. We want the right to vote independently and privately. And so we at Indiana Vote by Mail advocate for able and able-bodied and disabled voters to have, for everyone to have equal access to the, to the polls. So this is what it actually looks like. So we were in Orange County, California on uh, March 2nd, which was the day before Super Tuesday. And then that evening we went to Denver and we were in Denver all day on Super Tuesday, March 3rd. And uh, the, the drop box, these are drop boxes and they have a number of them located throughout their jurisdictions. The one on the left is a drop box in Orange County and that woman is walking up a ballot and putting it in the drop box and it clearly does not look like a post office box. It clearly is marked that it's a ballot drop box. I don't know how you could mistake it for a post office box. And it's a very thin slot. About the only thing you can get in that is a, is a, a ballot envelope that they use in Orange County. Um, 
And then on the right is the one in Denver. It's a smaller version and it's located outside of a library that happened to be a vote center that day. Um, both locations went through um, great detail with us about how they um, control the chain of custody around the retrieval of those ballots. So they send two um, election workers out to a drop box to pick up election mail at least once a day. Um, they have to make sure that the drop box hasn't been tampered with, it hasn't, that no one's tried to destroy it in some way or tamper with it in some way, that the seals haven't been broken. They open it together, it's under dual control, they take out the ballots, they reseal it, note the time, note the seal numbers, and then take the, the ballots back to a central collection point. In Orange County, Orange County has about three times the voters of Marion County. Marion County has somewhere around 650 or 670,000 voters. Um, so they, had, they were quite a sophisticated operation. Denver is, the city of Denver, county of Denver, is a little bit smaller than Marion County with 500,000, about 500,000 registered voters. Um, so, you know, smaller number of drop boxes. I think Orange County had maybe 100 or more drop boxes located throughout their county at various drive up drop off points. And Denver had, I think about 25 um, that you could, you know, they had, they had cones set up on the roadway and people steer in traffic so people could drop, just drive up and drop off their, their ballots. It was a nice sight to behold. And no lines in the vote centers on that day. So it was Super Tuesday, which was a super important day in election season. And we didn't see lines in vote centers. So that was kind of refreshing. So here's what happens when the ballots come back. So again, they're picked up throughout election season at least once a day from each drop box, if not more often. Um, they end up in trays. They go through this high speed sorter. Oops, I mean to go ahead. Um, they go through this high speed sorter and this is the one from Denver. Again, the operation in Orange County was just huge because they have so many voters. I think what we saw in Denver was more akin to what we might need it's in, in the largest counties in Indiana. Anyway, this is a high speed sorter and this uh, row of ballot envelopes is gonna go through that sorter probably in a matter of a minute or so. And they're flying through that are, they're at a super high rate of speed, but the back of the ballot envelope is, an image is being captured at the back of the ballot envelope. And then that, that image is being adjusted into software. And then that software matches that image, that voter signature with other examples of the voter signature that is gonna be on file and displays it to election workers. So 180 degrees from where I took this picture and it wasn't any point in taking pictures of people sitting at com computer screens, but I could have turned around and shown you a dozen computers where people are sitting at computer screens, like just doing signature comparison. So it's bringing up John Doe and it's bringing up multiple examples of John Doe's signature and they're saying yes or no to the ballot envelope, whatever. Um, so they just sit there and work uh, doing signature verification. All the election workers who do signature verification undergo forensic handwriting signature training every time they work an election. And no single individual can reject a ballot. So if I'm sitting a, a ballot envelope if I'm sitting working at a computer and I said, oh, here's John Doe's signature and it doesn't match these other signatures that I have. So, you know, his voter registration or other times he's voted or a signature from the BMB or some other state database. I, I can't, I don't feel comfortable that any of them match the signature on the, that's on this ballot envelope. So I'm going to reject it. That then goes in, in the software. It goes in a queue over to another election worker of the opposite party who then doesn't know where it's come from, it's just shown up in their queue and they either accept it or reject it. If that person also rejects it, it goes to a second tier bipartisan review team for folks to look at it even further and say, do we accept or reject this picture of this ballot envelope because we're not sure the signatures match because our the first stage people weren't sure it matched. Um, if the second tier rejects it, then it has to go through a cure process. So there are two avenues for a cure process. There is a um, signature, a missing signature cure process, which is easy enough. Every state has different procedures in place for how voters are um, contacted to cure the missing signature on their ballot envelope. For signature discrepancies, that's a more serious matter. I know in Denver, what they do is they will say, if it's a true discrepancy, they send the voter a notice in some way or another and if the voter 
contacts them, then they work on curing that signature discrepancy. If the voter ignores it, then some period of time passes, and I'm not sure what that period of time is, but some period of time passes, not much time, and they send another letter or whatever notice. Come cure the signature because we're not sure it matches the signature that's on file, signatures we have on file. And if the voter ignores that when they get a third notice, and if they ignore the third notice, it gets referred to legal authorities for further investigation and possible prosecution because it could be an instance of voter fraud. So all of us like to say, well, my signature doesn't look anything like when I registered to vote a bazillion years ago. And you know what? It doesn't. But if you take your signature from a bazillion years ago and every signature that you've done every time you voted in between then and your signature from your BMV record or possible other state databases and compare all of them, that's really hard to forge. And that's where the security is around vote by mail. That's an incredibly hard process to um, get um, fraudulent ballots through. So here's just what it looks like after the ballots go through the signature process. So most ballots, most ballot envelopes go through the yes process. There really aren't that many that end up getting rejected by after the bipartisan review team re um, reviews them and everything and it goes through that rigorous process. Um, so at the top on the left and right is uh, Denver and on the bottom is Orange County. On the left are um, slitting machines to open the ballot envelopes. And that's just a convenient way for workers to be able to take the ballot out of the envelope without people having to sit there and slit open the envelopes themselves. It's just a faster process. At the point that the ballot gets extracted from the envelope, the ballot then is completely anonymous. Nobody knows who that ballot came from. The folks on the right are merely preparing the ballots to um, go through the tabulation process. So they're unfolding them. They're making sure there aren't any slits when they went through the uh, um, envelope slitting machine, that there aren't any folds or any other, you know, staples or some silly thing that somebody did to the ballot. They want to make sure that they're all stacked up and flat and ready to go through the tabulation machine. Interestingly, um, in vote by mail states, they go through this whole process, the signature verification, the envelope slitting, the, the um, ballot preparation in batches and even go through tabulation machines all through election season. What they don't do is total the election until the polls close on election evening. We can't do that in Indiana. The only thing we can do in Indiana is verify the signature, which I, before the elect, before election day, I think most counties do that. I don't know that for certain. I know in Marion County where I live, they do. Um, but, you know, verify the signature so you know on election day you can start to open the envelopes, but come election day, according to Indiana statute, then we can start opening the envelopes. Um, you know, in Denver, we were in, in Denver for the close of polls at 7 p.m. and we watched them um, release election results within a couple of minutes after 7 p.m. because they had actually processed most of the ballots that they had received all through election season and they were only dealing with the ballots that they got on election day which was a small number of the total ballots that were were cast throughout election season so it's possible to do but you have to have the right infrastructure in place and in indiana we don't necessarily have the right infrastructure or the stat the statutory infrastructure as well so it's very important that voter rolls are kept clean. It's important to understand that when you have a change of address on file with the post office that mail ballots are not forwarded by, by the postal service. They go back to the election office. The vote at home states use a number of methods to keep the voter rolls clean, including the frequency with which they do updates. So I, I liken this to you know, running a mile today and running a marathon tomorrow. You know you're not gonna be able to do that. If you're going to run a marathon, you got to set a goal for yourself and you got to keep running and running and running. You got to keep at it all the time, in other words. There are various tools for updating voter rolls. There's something called the Electronic Registration Information Center, ERIC, that 30 states in Washington, D.C. are members of. And then there's the National Change of Address uh, database from the Postal Service, and then Social Security death records and in-state databases like the Bureau of Motor Vehicles and the Department of Revenue. But all of these together you know, states have to keep working this. It's like exercising. You just got to keep working and keeping your voter rolls clean all the time because when election rolls around, you don't want to suddenly go, oh my gosh, I've got to clean up my voter rolls. No, you should have been doing that all along. And that's what we need to improve on in Indiana as well. 
So our friends at votedhome.org um, have some nice graphics and research that we use. We are not formally affiliated with them, but they do have a lot of uh, nice information to share with us and we are happy to use it. We do our own research as well, but they have some really good material. So they did a, a US map of where the states were as far as vote by mail. And there's kind of five steps that you go through. So, you know, as th this map needs to be updated as well. It's from May. And as we know, in the last four months, a lot has changed. Um, so there's a number of steps, smaller, ever smaller number of, of states where there is an excuse required. Indiana is in kind of the second stage where an excuse is required, but at least we get an age waiver if you're over 65. Um, there's a, most states actually are in step three where no excuse is required. So you still have to apply for an absentee ballot, but th those states don't care why you're asking for an absentee ballot. They're just gonna send you one if you ask for one. There are a small number of states in the no excuse permanent uh, category. So they make you apply, but you only have to apply once and then you can check, you have the option of checking a box to say, I always want my ballot this way in future, stop asking me to apply. You can opt for that or not opt for that, by the way. Um, and then obviously the states that are full vote at home. So the, the dark blue states should also now include Nevada and New Hampshire. Um, so there are more and more states moving in this direction. Um, interestingly, Virginia, you don't usually see states move this fast, this, um, this color, dark blue this fast, but Virginia was in step one where an excuse was required and they moved all the way up to stage four, no excuse with a permanent option um, this past legislative session. So it is possible, but you have to have the political will to do it. So let's not compare ourselves to those crazy coastal states who may be doing things very different than what we do in the Midwest. So of the 12 states in the upper Midwest, Indiana is also an outlier. 10 of the states have no excuse required. Indiana still has an excuse required. Interestingly, the states around Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and Michigan, each have about 8 million voters apiece. So almost twice as many voters as Indiana and they figured out how to do no excuse. So it kind of begs the question, why can't we figure out how to do it in Indiana? Um, Nebraska um, did an experiment where they, I think it was for the 2018 primary election. They let a couple of the counties in Nebraska try vote by mail. This is the way it, it goes in most states. They, they have it tested in a couple of counties for a couple of county clerks that are feeling a little experimental and have gotten their ducks in a row or whatever. The legislature allows a few counties to do it. And in Nebraska in 2018, those counties had such higher voter turnout than the rest of the counties that it got the rest of the counties to sit up and notice and go, hmm, okay, maybe we can do it too. And so ne Nebraska is quickly moving to be a vote by mail state as well. It's just one example. There's, here's a couple of other graphical representations. It's much like the, the map of a couple slides ago from uh, vote at, the Vote at Home folks. The one on the left is from the folks at Washington Post, and I think this was from July. And the one on the right is from the New York Times. But you can see kind of the swath of states, you know, this swath of states, Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. Oops, I lost my presentation. Um, there's the same swath of states that are excuse required states. And you can see most of the country is now moving to do voting in a different way. And New York Times is a little bit harder to follow, but you can see it's kind of the same swath of states, but it's just interesting to see how many states are moving to try to enfranchise more voters instead of keeping things very closed down for its voters. So over the last several legislative sessions, the Indiana House Election Committee and the Indiana Senate Election Committee have not scheduled hearings on bills for no excuse absentee, permanent no excuse absentee, vote by mail, automatic or same day voter registration or pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds. So you all probably know that, you know, the legislature, the legislative session comes, opens up and all the bills get assigned to different committees and the committee chairs, uh, 
really have a lot of power to control what gets heard in committee and what doesn't get heard in committee. I will say for the no excuse absentee voting, the first one there, there was a bill in the 2018 legislative session that went through, that made it through the Indiana House, even with its uh, Republican majority, where it, you know, they passed, they passed it out of the Senate, excuse me, the House, I said the Senate, or I said the House, I meant the Senate. It, they passed it out of the Senate um, for no excuse, to remove the excuses off the absentee ballot application. So it made it out of the Senate, and of course during crossover, it goes over to the House, and it died in committee at the House because the committee chair wouldn't hear it. Um, so there just has to be the, the legislative will, and it, I'm, unfortunately it's gonna come from all of us calling our legislators and doing a lot of um, activism to get our legislators to understand that we really want to move Indiana forward in this regard. So how do we get there? We wanna create a different vision for voting in Indiana. We wanna make it easier to vote by absentee ballot with no excuse and permanent no, no excuse. And that's kind of along that continuum that we saw on the, in the earlier slide. Did we kind of inch our way toward vote by mail. We don't do it in one big movement. Um, and we wanna see the excuses removed for the 2020 general election. Full disclosure, Indiana vote by mail and myself as the lead plaintiff and eight others are the plaintiffs in, in the lawsuit that's currently in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals um, to force Indiana to remove its excuses for the November election. So far, the governor and the Indiana Election Commission have not done that, um, and they could have done it. They could have done it um, when they did it for the June primary, but they, they have not done it for the November election. Um, and we would like to see that happen, but we're just now going to have to wait for maybe the court to rule, although the governor and the Election Commission could do something now. They don't need the court to tell them what to do. Um, the way we saw, as I said earlier, most states move to vote by mail is through pilot programs, usually by county, sometimes by municipality, but more often by county, and then local, a local election or a state versus federal election or a special election. So they kind of inch into it, get their feet wet, make sure they have the infrastructure in place, make sure they have the, the bugs worked out, and then as other county clerks see that there's success, they roll it out to other counties in the state. In Indiana, what we need to do is fund the infrastructure. So we have, um, you know, 20 counties have 68% of Indiana's voters. Those are probably the 28 counties, excuse me, the 20 counties that need the most infrastructure. All the counties probably need some infrastructure, um, but the largest counties in terms of number of voters probably need the most infrastructure like we saw in Denver. You know, the, the high-speed scanner, the envelope slitters, the the high-speed tabulators that I didn't show you a picture of, the, the software that runs the, um, the signature comparison so workers can sit down and do that signature comparison. All of that takes money, probably local, state, and federal, a combination of it. And we need to look at allocating resources appropriately given the size of the, of the county for numbers of voters. And then, of course, in Indiana, what I would hate to see happen is that Indiana kind of says, oh, well, we wanna do vote by mail. Oh, we tried it here, but it didn't really work out here. We're Indiana, we're different. No, we're not. There are other people that have walked the, this road ahead of us and have worked out bugs um, based on their own state's circumstances, but we can learn from them um, and we should learn from them about what the pluses and minuses are, what the best practices are, what the failures are that they learn from, and create a voting system in Indiana that enfranchises more voters. And we can do it in Indiana, but again, we have to have the political will to do it. And there are resources like the resources that vote at home, the Center for Tech and Civic Life, the Center for Civic Design, all kinds of resources available to the state. The USPS, I mean, there's tons of resources available that the state could move to make the voting experience easier and more efficient and with a paper trail for all voters. So there's three things that you can do, um, register to vote or help others to register by going to indianavoters.in.gov. And that website is super efficient way to register. You can check your registration. So if you are currently registered, go to the same website and make sure that your address is current and that you are an active voter. And then also you can, if you qualify, apply for an absentee ballot at that same website. Go into my voter portal, you enter your first name, last name, county, and date of birth, and then it takes you into your information and it's very easy to just get 
the application, you don't need to print it off. You just submit it online and boom, you know right away that the county clerk's office, the election office has your absentee ballot application if you qualify under Indiana's current reasons. So to remember for the 2020 elections, voting by mail is safe and effective. It provides a paper trail for all votes cast, but Indiana doesn't necessarily have the infrastructure in place to do it super efficiently. County clerks and election staff are going to work really hard and do work really hard to make our elections efficient, but they don't necessarily have the infrastructure and we have to give them time to get through the counting process. It doesn't mean that anything's wrong, but we have to be patient for election results. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to increase civic engagement in Indiana um, by increasing voter turnout. And vote by mail is just one thing that is one spoke in that wheel that creates greater voter turnout. It's not the only thing. Things like automated and same day voter registration do that too. Things like vote centers. So in Marion County, for instance, we are a vote center county. So on, for instance, on election day, if I were gonna vote in person, I could go to any of the 188 polling sites in Marion County on election day. Um, there are about half of Indiana's 92 counties that are vote center counties. About half of them are still precinct based polling. Vote centers really cut down on the number of provisional ballots and it's just easier on voters altogether. They go to one place and it's got a long line and they find another place to go and maybe it's less of a wait and it's more convenient for them. Um, time off work to vote. Indiana is one of the only states that doesn't have laws on the books that require employers to give employees time off work to vote. And then a couple of the vote by mail states have actually worked out where when a voter moves, the uh, voter registration automatically moves to their new address when they put in a change of address with the post office and then the post office notifies the secretary of state and so on and so forth. And then they get a card from their uh, county registrar or county election office to say, hey, you're now registered to vote at this address. If you don't want to vote at this address, tell us. Um, and then things like redistricting reform and civic education, of course, we want to increase voter turnout and create a voting culture in Indiana. So I wanted to show you two, two uh, three things actually. So here are the links to the uh, misinformation, combating misinformation. And I think it's all important that we are educated as voters about how to deal with misinformation and disinformation. And then the safety of vote by mail, there are a number of studies here. So the Heritage Foundation's link and the, the couple links from the Brennan Center, the Bipartisan Policy Center comes out with a lot of good white papers. The Columbia University study is a little bit old, but it's still relevant. Um, the UCLA Voting Rights Project is from a little bit earlier this, this um, year. Um, there's a bunch of other resources. I mean, it goes on and on and on. I tried to limit it to just two pages, but I probably could have gone on for several more. And then there are links to videos here. So if you'd like to see what kind of videos other states that do vote by mail have put together, you can go watch it on YouTube or just look it up on YouTube yourself if you'd like to. Um, and don't use these links, just search it yourself and you'll see how vote by mail actually works in other states. It's very effective um, and it, in, it enfranchises more voters and creates higher voter turnout and creates a paper trail for all elections. So I will stop there and we can take questions if you'd like. See, there's... Sarah, did you want to do that or did you want me to? Oh, I thought you were on question duty, Lisa, but I'm happy to need it. No, no I, I, want, I just, just didn't want to. Um, so uh, going back in the chat, um, early in your presentation, Monique asked the question, um, barriers to voting. Often there's not comprehensive or consistent data about the people running, what they're for, what they're against. Is there any effort to improve this? And I did respond to that at the time and said that we would we would touch on a little bit about vote411.org. Um, so I will share that vote411.org uh, is um, a website that anyone can go to. Um, it is available, it is, it is provided by the League of Women Voters Education Fund. The process for entering information, uh, we have a committee of League of Women Voters members who have been working for quite a while um, on this. They, uh, they put the survey together of what information we want 
to be able to provide from the candidates. Um, and then we send that survey out to each candidate and the candidates provide their responses to us. Um, we send up one set of questions on, on current issues out to the candidates before the primary. And then we sent another set of questions out um, kind of updating our questions relevant to some of the things that have been happening in the world uh, since the primary. Um, and so uh, as of uh, September 15th, and I know that Shelly is on here and Shelly has worked very, very hard along with some other members of, our, of the league um, to put this together. And I believe that September 15th is when we are planning on going live with Vote 411. Um, Vote 411 is also a resource that you can use uh, if you would like to, it, it's sort of a, an additional resource um, similar to Indiana um, voters.org or voters.gov or .com. They, they, they bought all of the Indiana voters addresses. Um, so uh, you, can, you can do a lot of the same things on vote 411 that you can do uh, with, uh, with the Indiana site. You can check your voter registration. Uh, you can find out where your polling place is. We're actually also creating a voter guide that's going to have some explanation for voters about how to handle certain circumstances, whether it might be a, a change of name or a change of address. There are various things that uh, the voter guide also addresses. Um, Lisa, if I could say um, quickly, Please. you know, when we were when we were in um, Orange County and in Denver, they published to every registered voter a voter guide that includes all of that information. It's a printed form that they send out to voters and it's actually a booklet. I mean, Orange County had kind of a booklet for every precinct and every, um, you know, that contains all the information on the, who's on the ballot, how to vote. I mean, all that kind of comprehensive information in one source that's printed. It's also all available online. You know, in Indiana, it seems like it's a philosophical difference because the Secretary of State doesn't believe it's the role of the state to do those things necessarily, all those things. They do some of it, like here's where you vote and here's how you register and here's the deadlines, but not to tell you who's on the ballot and you know some of the other information that voters are like, well, wait a minute, why can't this all be in one place? Um, and so I think that vote by mail states generally tend to do a better job than Indiana does, but I think it's because of a philosophical difference. Well, and I will also add that Vote 411 is available to uh, across the country. There are some communities that don't necessarily put in the local information, um, but the, uh, the League of Women Voters nationally um, gathers this information. Um, and so I actually, uh, last spring referred my sister-in-law down in Tennessee to vote 411 and she got very excited because of the fact that it was the first time she felt like she really had some explanation of what the candidates were were running for what they stood for and how she could get more information about them so um, we often tell vote 411 we love that resource the League of Women Voters does an awesome job we're, we're going to be promoting it very, very heavily over the next two months. Um, okay, so the next question uh, came up. Um, uh, Gina Asher asked, um, they don't monitor the reasons, but you do have to affirm, I think we're talking about in Indiana, you do have to affirm that you fit one of those reasons. Um, she asked the question, didn't the state election administration say, if you can go to Kroger during a pandemic, you can go to the polls? So simply being afraid to go to the polls because of the pandemic is not one of the 11 reasons. Is that correct to your knowledge? Correct. So last week at the um, governor's weekly news conference, Secretary Lawson said, if you're confined to your home and you're compromised in some way, you can vote by, um, you can vote by absentee ballot. But if you're going out running errands, and you're afraid of COVID, that's not a valid reason. So that, I, I was a little offended by that. Um, so. I think one of the concerns that some people have, and I, uh, we were talking about this before we started the program, um, that I had to uh, 
go this week and get a test because of the fact that I had been exposed to someone. But if this was election week, it would be too late for me to apply for an absentee ballot. So I think that's one of the concerns that people, some people have is uh, that if you um, don't find out that you're, you've possibly been exposed or you're in quarantine until the week of or the week before the election, it's too late for you to apply for an absentee ballot at that point. Yes, but you can you can apply up to noon on the day before the election to uh, for a travel board. Oh, okay. And okay. that's online. Can you explain, that's to, online. Us what a, can you explain to us briefly what a travel board is? Sure, for the sure. So um, a travel board is, you know, you can't, I'm just going to take a really egregious example. You're confined to your home, like something happened to you and you're confined to your home in some way. Um, you can apply to uh, have a travel board come to your house. And the people that would come to your house is a Democrat and a Republican. And they would, you know, not watch you. I mean, they were not gonna watch what your selections are, but they're gonna present your ballot to you. You mark your ballot, you seal it in the envelope and you send them on your way, but it's under dual control because you have one from each major party. But you can apply to do that up to, I think it's on the election calendar. Shelly, just nod your head if this is right. It's up to noon on like uh, noon the day before the election, isn't it? I think it's noon. I think that's it's on indianavoters.in.gov and in that gray bar down the side, apply to vote by travel board or something like that. And um, I'm pretty sure it's it's noon um, the day before the election. You can apply. Okay. Um, Monique asked the question. Uh, we did not have the text tracking. You talked about the text tracking um, uh, in the primaries. And no, no, that is so. Let me be clear, the, the intelligent mail barcode, that scannable barcode is available from the post office. Um, counties can download that software themselves from the post office and apply that to election mail on the inbound and outbound. That barcode in vote by mail states, that barcode gets assigned to me for an election. Um, and then I'll get a different barcode the next time there's an election, but that allows me to get um, a, a, a sign up for text alerts based on that barcode because it's associated with me. We don't have any of that in Indiana. What Indiana does is counties will use the barcode because they're, they're using the post office to put, or a mail service to put the barcode on the outbound, but they have no barcode on the inbound. So we don't have that in Indiana. Vote by mail states do have that. Okay. Um, Joan asked the question, will there be any drop boxes available other than at the courthouse in Noblesville? No, so there's a couple, this is where we need some leadership at the state level about these things. So there are different, inter like if there's 92 counties and there's 92 different ways that counties think about this. So um, in, in conversations with several county clerks, a couple of them pointed out, well, we can't have drop boxes in Indiana. And I think statutorily, in fact, we can't, like we saw in Orange County and Denver, we can't have those located throughout jurisdictions where voters can drop off ballots. Um, but some county clerks are interpreting them that a little bit loosely and say, well, we have a, a slot in the whatever in the courthouse and we're going to allow ballot mail to be returned that way. Um, and that's their version of a drop box. Um, I don't know that anybody's going to argue that, but um, we don't have drop boxes like I showed you in the presentation. We do not have that. Um, so um... Shelly has also added into the chat that the travel board will not come to your house if you have COVID. And also Sarah has added that the date for the travel board, uh, the deadline for that is Monday, November 2nd, which is I think what you had said. Okay, and I think it's noon. I'm pretty sure it's noon. Sarah. Yes, yes. And uh, Gina has asked a question. Um, Does Indiana have a similar signature comparison procedure as other states for absentee ballots? Um, you know, that is also something that needs to be worked out statutorily. There's a lot of work to do in the Indiana le legislature to make sure some of these controls are in place. So uh, no. So what the vote by mail states have are those high speed sorters that are at a, at a very high rate of speed taking um, pictures of the back of ballot envelopes and then pulling that into software and then displaying that in software and there's a big old engine. I don't understand. It seems easy to me because I'm not a computer person, but you know what I mean. There's a big old engine behind that that has integrated all those different state databases of voter signatures. And when my ballot envelope gets displayed in the software, it's already pulled up all the examples of my signature. So the worker is sitting there going, oh, okay. And they're not having to go hunt and peck for this stuff. It's just there for them to look at. 
we need to build that integration in Indiana. We do not have that in Indiana. And I will tell you that in 92 counties, there's probably 92 different ways of doing signature comparisons. Not very efficient. It's another way that Indiana is not that efficient and another way that we have to deal with statutorily. Okay. Um, any other questions? It seems like we've, I think we've gotten through pretty much the questions that uh, have been posted on the chat. Um, Sarah, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead with my little. Sure. Yeah, we're um, at eight o'clock. So if you just want to take a couple minutes, Lisa. Sure. Uh, great. Um, I'm going to put um, the uh, Facebook address for the League of Women Voters of Hamilton County. Um, into the chat and feel free to come visit us there, um, like us, um, follow us. Also, um, I'm adding the League of Women Voters uh, email address. Uh, we are going to be hosting a series of candidate forums, as, as Barbara said, the, you know, the next thing is, uh, is um, talking to state legislators about some of these issues. And we can start by asking some questions of our candidates uh, as they are uh, campaigning for office. Um, we are gonna be hosting a series of candidate forums in September. Um, we will be hosting two forums on September 14th and 15th. These will be for can uh, county offices. Um, we will also be holding forums on the 21st and 22nd of September for state offices, that's state legislative offices. So that's uh, two Senate seats in Hamilton County uh, and several House seats. Um, and then the grand finale of our candidate forums um, in September will be September 28th. We will be hosting uh, the 5th Congressional District candidate forum uh, on September 28th. Um, so we will have all three of the party candidates, um, the Republican, Democrat, and Libertarian candidates will be involved in that. They will all be virtual events. Um, we are partnering, the League of Women Voters is partnering with the Public Libraries of Hamilton County. So we will be working with um, the Hamilton East Public Libraries in Fishers and Noblesville the Westfield Public Library, and Sarah has graciously agreed to work with us again um, from the Carmel Clay Public Library. Um, so we look forward to uh, the, the way that we'll be doing these as they will be um, live discussions amongst the candidates, but we will be recording them and then we will be sharing them out on our social media as well as the libraries that we're partnering with. So uh, you'll be able to watch those forums. We are going to be asking that uh, anyone who's interested can submit questions through the League of Women Voters email address and we will have members of the League who will be um, compiling those questions into a list that we will be asking all of the candidates. Um, and I think that's all I have to share tonight and I just want to say on behalf of the League of Women Voters, thank you both to uh, Sarah and the Carmel Clay Public Library and thank you very much to Barbara Tully um, for all of this uh, fascinating information and I look forward to seeing where it takes us. Thank you for having me and I appreciate the ability to take the, uh, the opportunity to take this message to a wider audience. So thank you for your questions and thank you to the Carmel K Clay Public Library for having me. Thanks Barbara, thanks Lisa, and thank you everyone who attended this evening. I'm wondering, Barbara, you had a lot of slides with links and information. Um, would you be willing to share those with me? That way, if anyone wants to email me, um, send those out just so they can explore some of those resources. Absolutely, I will send that to you. Guys. Sound like a plan? Okay, I think everyone should have my email address because I did email you um, the event information on Zoom. Um, if you would like uh, copies of those couple slides with all the links, um, and resources, feel free to send me an email and I'll get them to you. Um, maybe not tomorrow, but pretty soon. We'll get them to you soon. Um, thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a wonderful night and stay safe and well. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah.